lights. <laughs> this is CS50, and this is week 10, our very last together. And before we dive in today, I um, just wanted to acknowledge how much work we know this course is for, for everyone. Uh, we know there's still a tad bit of work remaining, but we do hope ultimately that you're really proud of what you've pulled off over the past few months only. And indeed, the final project, whatever it is you end up building, really is meant to be this capstone where you're finally standing on your own. There's no distribution code, there's not really a specification, and really just an opportunity to to take all this knowledge out now for a spin. And we do hope it serves you well longer term. Before we dive in, too, just wanted to offer a number of thanks for so much of the team uh, that helps out behind the scenes, in particular um, the Memorial Hall team, our hosts here who make all of the space and the activities behind the scenes possible, the Education Support Services team who helps with audio and video and more, and then especially CS50's own team, all here in the darkness, helping out in front of the camera, behind the camera. If we could, a huge round of applause for everyone that makes this possible. You might have noticed um, that these have been unusual times, and we've had some unusual guests in the front of the room here, since we weren't sure what to expect early on as to just what protocols would be on campus. And so we have, of course, all of these plush figures behind the scenes who have been helping out uh, behind the camera, behind the monitors, and so forth. Um, and what many of you will see if you've been watching right now or in the future of these videos online, you'll see a lot of backs of heads so that there's a little bit of characteristic to some of the shots that we have here. Um, but this is actually born of an inspiration that comes from wh who will be ultimately today's special guest, um, Jennifer A. Lee, in fact, whom we'll meet in just a little bit, um, was ultimately uh, the good friend of the class that inspired this tradition of using puppetry in some form in the class here. Um, what I see down below is, is a shot like this here. Um, and funny enough, it seems that with machine learning, what it is nowadays, artificial intelligence, so to speak, on social media and the like, like literally no joke, I pulled up Twitter earlier today, and among my suggestions for whom I should follow, now, we're literally the suggestions here. Um, this is uh, perhaps not surprising, though, because some weeks back I actually started following uh, Count Von Count, whom you might remember from Sesame Street. If you are not following him already, this is an amazing uh, count to follow, an actual count to follow. Um, and it's actually an amazing use of programming. So this account joined in April of 2012. It's got 198,000 followers out of after, uh, as of today. And what it's been doing for like nine plus years is tweeting out a number, one per day. This morning's was 3,327. Uh, 3, Yesterday's was 3,326. Uh, uh, uh. And so presumably someone's just written a program, Python or something else, that's just generating these tweets once a day. Even more amusing, though, is that like every tweet for the past nine years has like 20 or 30 comments on it from people who are following it. So perhaps consider following this same account and the same application of CS as well. Wanted to also thank CS50's team behind the cameras. You might recall uh, the teaching fellows um, last year in particular, when everything was on Zoom, kindly put together this visualization of TCP IP and the passage, uh, passing of messages among routers and intern computers, for instance, from Phyllis at bottom right to Brian at top left. Uh, just wanted to thank the team, but also reveal to you all that uh, these takes were not perfect by any means. And in fact, here's just 60 seconds or so of outtakes of us trying to get data from point A to point B. Nothing good? Buffering? Okay. Josh? Nice. Helen? Oh! <laughs> it's Moni. No, oh, wait. That was amazing, Josh. Uh, um, Sophie? <laughs> That was perfect. Moni? <laughs> I think I... Hey, me. Over to you all. Oh, nice. Thank you. Guy? That was amazing. That Thank was you all. So good. All right. If we could, too, a round of applause for all the teaching fellows, teaching assistants, and course assistants who make the course possible as well. 
Before we now do a, a bit of review of the semester, thought we'd take first a higher level view of where we've come from. Recall, of course, from the syllabus and literally week zero, we claim this that what ultimately matters in this course is not so much where you end up relative to classmates, but where you end up relative to yourself when you begin. And we really do mean that. There are certainly classmates of yours who have been programming since they're 10 years old, but there are two thirds of your classmates who were not, in fact, that case. And so behind you, in front of you, to the left and to the right today, are so many classmates who have had a very shared experience. Experience with you, but the only person that really matters at the end of the day in terms of how you've progressed in this class truly is where you, in fact, began. And I realize that with CS and especially this course and with programming assignments, especially, it can feel like week after week that you're not really making progress because it might feel like you're struggling every darn week. But that's just really because we kind of keep moving the bar higher and higher, pushing the finish line a little further and further ahead. Because think back to like week one. When this, for instance, whoops, when this alone was hard, and you were just trying to get Mario to ascend a pyramid that might look a little something like this, or the week after, when you started dabbling with readability, or two weeks after, Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number four, Privet Drive, and so forth, trying to analyze just how complex a sentence like that was, and manipulating strings and characters for the first time. And then, of course, we progressed to deeper uh, dives into algorithms, and actually implementing something that's all too real world these days, and implementing electoral algorithms in a few different forms. Dabbling thereafter in a bit of forensics, a bit of imagery, and taking images like this here and filtering it in a number of ways. Ultimately Understanding hopefully how these things are implemented underneath the hood so that henceforth, when all you're doing is tapping an icon on your phone or clicking a command on your computer, you can infer, even if you didn't write that particular code, how the thing is likely working. And even if you had started to get your footing then around week four, then things escalated quickly further to data structures. But recall for your spell checker, you implemented a fairly sophisticated data structure known as a hash table. And even if you struggled to get that working again, Think back five years, uh, five weeks prior, you were just trying to get for loops to work and variables to work. And so each week realized there was significant progress. And then if you aggregate all these most recent weeks with Python and SQL, HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, I mean, you built your very own web application. And many of you will go on and build something grander for your own final project or focus again on C or on Python alone or the like. But ultimately, aggregating all of these technologies and kind of stitching together something that you yourself created. We might have kind of put some of the foundation there in place, but the, the end result ultimately is yours. So, at the end of the day, as we promised in week zero, this course is really about computational thinking, cleaning up your thought process, getting you to think a little more logically, more methodically, and to express yourself just as logically and methodically. But it's also about, in some form, critical thinking. And at the end of the day, what computer science is, is really just taking input, producing output, ideally correct output, and all the hard stuff is in the middle there. But what we do hope you have in your, your toolkit, so to speak, is all the more of a mental model, all the more of an understanding of like first principles from which you can derive new outputs, new conclusions based on those inputs. And certainly today, right, there's so much misinformation or miseducation in the world, and just being able to take input and produce proper output in and of itself is a compelling skill. And indeed, when you all find yourselves invariably in, pos in engineering positions where you're asked to build something because you now can, or perhaps you're in a managerial Role where you decide you should build something because you know people who can, I would also start to consider, even though the past 10 plus weeks have all been about build this because we asked you to, to really start to consider whether it's for fun, for profession, for political purposes, or the like, should you build something? And actually considering now that you have this skill, how you can use it most responsibly and not just make a website do something or make an app do something because it can be done, but really start to ask and ask of others, like, should we be doing this? It's just a skill that you can, but don't necessarily have to use. Now, when it comes to writing some actual code, keep in mind that you might continue to evaluate, or your employer or your colleagues might continue to evaluate your code along these same axes. These are not CS50 specific. Correctness, does it do, does it do what it's supposed to do? Design, like how well qualitatively is it implemented? And then style, how readable is it? How pretty is it? And these three axes should really guide all of your thinking, whether it's for a test or a project or an open source project or the like. Like all three of these things really matter. And so if you're in the mindset of wondering, oh, do I have to worry about style for this? Do I have to comment this? Like, the answer is always yes. This is what it means to be a good programmer, a good engineer, to optimize these kinds of axes. Now, what about sort of 
to those tools in the toolkit? Well, let's focus on just a couple here,、uh, full circle at the end of the semester. Abstraction, recall, was one of the tools in the toolkit that we proposed is all about taking like, complicated problems, complicated ideas, and simplifying them to really the essence. So you can focus on really just what matters or what helps you get real work done. And then related to that was also this notion of precision. Even as you abstract things away, you still have to be super precise when you're writing code for a computer or just giving instructions to another human so that they are implementing your ideas, your, your algorithms correctly. And sometimes these two goals, abstraction and precision, can rather be at odds at one another. And what we thought we'd do is give everyone a sheet of paper today, which you probably received on the way in, if not a pen as well. If you didn't receive, hopefully you or a friend near you has a sheet of paper and a pen or a pencil. Do go ahead and grab that. And we thought we'd、uh, come full circle too and see if we can't get a brave volunteer to come up. On the stage here, and we just need someone to give some stage directions. All right, I like it when people start pointing and pointing. How about you being pointed at? Yes? Yes, you,、uh, yes, come on down. Well, there'll be one more opportunity after this. Come on down. What's your name? Claire. Claire? Okay, a round of applause for Claire for being so enthusiastic. <laughs> come on over here. Would you like to make a quick introduction to the group? Yeah. Hey. <laughs> I'm Claire.、Uh, yeah, that's all you need to know about me. All right. <laughs> so, what I'm about to hand Claire is a sheet of paper that has a drawing on it. And the goal at hand is for you all to ultimately follow Claire's hopefully very precise instructions because she's going to give you step by step instructions, an algorithm, if you will, for drawing something on that sheet of paper. All right, we're going to keep it in this、uh, manila envelope so that folks can't see through it. But this is what we would like. You to give verbal instructions to the audience to draw, and you can say anything you want, but you may not make physical hand gestures or the like, and, or dip it down so everyone can see it. Oh, that's so true. <laughs> that's so true. All right, go ahead. Step one. Wait, I could say whatever I want. Related to this problem, yes, I did. <laughs>、okay. Oh my God. Give them instructions for recreating this picture on their paper. Okay. Start with, uh, like, Like、um, a, a square, but, but it's. No, no hand gestures. Okay, okay, sorry, sorry. Start with a square, but it's like a diamond kind of. Like there's a point on top. <laughs> Wait, I should not be the one doing this. Okay, <laughs> so it's like a square, but yeah, start with a, a square. Okay, step two. <laughs> step two. Is that on one of the sides of the square, there's another square? <laughs> doing really well on the abstraction. I don't feel like I'm doing too hot. Okay. <laughs> does, this, does this affect my grade in any way? No, no. Okay. Go、awesome. on, two squares. Okay. And then there's like another square. <laughs> <laughs> But they're like not squares, they're like kind of slanted.、Um, And、there's another square in between, like next, next to those squares, connecting those squares. Okay. Any step four? Step four is that it should look like a cube. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so let's go ahead and pause here. Pause here. Let's, let's thank Claire for coming on up bravely. I'll take this. If,、uh, let's go ahead and collect just a few of these. If maybe Carter and Valerie, you wouldn't mind helping me grab just a few sheets of paper. If you'd like to volunteer what it is you drew in those seconds, just hand it over if you would like. No need for a name or anything like that. Okay, all right, very eager. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, sorry. Okay, that, that's, that's plenty. Let's come on up if you want to. Oh, you want to hand me yours too? Okay. Sorry, to reach. All right, so Carter, if you want to meet me up on stage for a second. So we have a whole bunch of submissions here that represent what it was Claire was describing. Let me go ahead and、uh, just project here in a moment. Use my camera. So here we have one. Let's see, Carter, feel free to just bring those on up here. Okay, so here we have one. I'll hold up. All right, so some squares overlapping started to look more like a cube. Thank you so much.、Uh, here, maybe in more primitive form. 
was another one. This one kind of started to have wheels, which was kind of. <laughs> and then things started to take shape, perhaps at the very end, both big cube and small cube. What it was that Claire was showing us now, if we project it, was in fact this. And it's actually exactly what Claire you just went through is actually a perfect example of like why abstraction can be hard and where the line is when you're just trying to communicate instructions. So, in fairness, it might have been nice to just start with we're going to draw a cube and like here's how, because that was kind of a spoiler at the end. But that too, a cube is an abstraction, but it's not very precise, right? Like how big is the cube? At what angle is it rotated? What is, how are you looking at it? And so when you were struggling to describe these squares, but no, they're kind of like diamonds or whatnot, I mean, that's because of this tension between what It is you're trying to abstract, but what it is you're trying to communicate. You could have gone maybe the complete other direction and maybe have been super precise and not abstract this thing away as a cube, but say to everyone, all right, everyone, put your pen down on the paper. Now draw a diagonal line to,、uh, say, southwest. At 45 degrees. Now do another one that's south. You could really get into the weeds and tell people to go up, down, left, right. Of course, it could get a little tricky if they sort of follow the direction incorrectly, but it would be hard for us all to know what it is we're drawing if all we're hearing are these very low level instructions. But that's what you're doing when you're writing code. You might implement a function called cube. How it works is via those low level instructions, but after that, you just don't care. You'd much rather think about it as a cube function, maybe with some arguments that speak to To the size or the rotation of it or the like. And that's where, again, abstraction can come in. So, as we've discussed for so many weeks now, these trade offs were manifest even in week zero, even if we didn't necessarily put our finger on it just then. Well, why don't we do things in a slightly different direction? If we could get one other volunteer. OK, a y come on down. I saw your hand first. One other volunteer who this time we're going to give the pen to. We're going to give the pen to. And what's your name? Jonathan. Jonathan, come on up. So, I'm going to make this screen be drawable in just a moment. But what we need you to do first on the honor system is close your eyes. All right, eyes are closed. Everyone else in the audience is about to see the picture that we want you to draw. And you all, the audience, are going to give Jonathan the step by step instructions this time around. So, eyes stay closed. This is what we're going to want Jonathan to draw. So, kind of ingrain it in your mind. If you need a refresher, we can have him close his eyes again. But、that's what we want him to draw. I'm going to go back to the blank screen. All right, Jonathan, you can open your eyes. We have a blank canvas. And now, step one what would you like Jonathan to draw first? Draw a circle, I heard. OK, a y it's a little smaller, I'm hearing now. OK, you can move it. Oh, no, don't do that. All right, let's, we'll, do, we'll give you one redo. Use three fingers to delete everything. Uh, three fingers all together. Yep. There we go.、Uh, farther apart. There we go. No, it's back. OK, I'll do this part.、Yeah. OK. All right. So I heard, thank you. I heard draw a circle. Would anyone like to finish the sentence more precisely? A smaller circle. On top. A medium sized circle at the top. All right, that's pretty good. Medium sized circle at the top. And no more deleting after this. Good. All right, step two. A line straight down. Yeah, OK. a y Good. All right, that was step two. Nicely done. What's that? Step three? Draw a line down from the bottom to the left. Draw a line down from the bottom to the left. At, OK. Good. All right, next. Let's go over here. Next one. Same thing, but on the right. Yes. All right.、Uh, that's what? One, two, three, four. Step five. Step, yes, step five. We do that, but higher, closer to the circle. Do that again, but higher, closer to the circle? On the right side. Oh. All right, we're going to have to go with it. Step six. Step six. Starting from the neck, draw a line down and to the right. You don't like that. He's, he's, what do you want him to do? Step six. 
<laughs> Can't, no one do. Where the other line ends, say again. Where the other line ends. Near the vertical line. Where the other line ends. Draw a line that goes down. OK. A couple more steps. Step seven. Seven. Draw a horizontally slanting line from the end of the line you just drew. Draw an, a line from the end of the line you just drew. Diagonally. OK, we're resorting to hand gestures now, but I think that's what you mean. Yes? OK, good. Uh, go good. All right, have one or two final steps. Let's get as close as we can. Say hi. Make him say hi. No. OK, hi. OK, and maybe one final step. We'll give him one more. Say again. Again? Put one of those lines from high to the circle. A line between high and the circle. All right, let's. Let's show Jonathan that's pretty darn close. Let's show him what, what we had in mind was this. So a round of applause for Jonathan, too, if we could. Thank you. A bigger round of applause for Jonathan, if we could. <laughs> All right. So I mean, this is actually, there is this thing in, in computer science known as pair programming. We actually program with someone else, and that's actually not all that dissimilar, trying to communicate your ideas to someone else. But notice just all of the ambiguities, and it certainly doesn't help that we're in a big space, but all of the ambiguities that arise when you're just trying to convey something precisely. So this is not necessarily as constrained as a program would, but it's representative of the end of the day, even after all these weeks, this stuff is hard. And in fact, it's not necessarily um, ever going to be completely straightforward because the problems you're going to try solving down the road, presumably, if you continue to apply these skills, themselves are just going to get more and more sophisticated. But hopefully, the, the feeling you get from accomplishing something as a result is just going to rise with them as well. Before we now do a bit of review, just wanted to offer a few suggestions in answer to an FAQ, which is like, what do I do after a class like CS50? Typically, about half of you will go on and take one or more other classes in CS, which is great, building on this kind of foundation. And about half of you will not. Like, this will be it. But very likely, certainly given how the world is trending, will you have opportunities in the arts, humanities, social sciences, or beyond to just apply programming to data sets, to problems in those own domains? And so, toward that end, we would encourage you to start thinking about how you can transition from what has been your cloud, uh, um, code space in the cloud to something client side, like using your own Mac and PC here on out so that you're not reliant on a courses infrastructure, a particular website. And even though we used a fairly industry standard tool, you can actually get almost all of that stuff running with some effort, perhaps, on your own Mac and PC. So terminal windows actually come built into Mac OS. If you go to your util applications folder, utilities, there is a program literally called terminal that has always been there even if you've never used it, that will behave very similar to what VS Codes does as well. In the world of Windows, can you similarly install a version of the terminal Windows software that we used in the cloud too to actually run similar commands like CD and LS and, and much more? We would encourage you ultimately to learn Git. You've been indirectly using Git this semester. When you run certain commands, we have been using Git underneath the hood of some of CS50's tools that essentially push your code, so to speak, to the cloud, to a place like github.com. But Git itself is an incredibly powerful and just useful tool for, one, backing up your code somewhere else to the cloud, which is effectively what we've used it for, but two, collaboration so that you can actually share your code more readily with other people, and three, building much bigger pieces of software where each of you work on different files, different folders, or even just different parts of the same file, and then somehow merge all of your handiwork together at the end of the day to build something much bigger than you as one person could 
alone. VS Code itself now, too, we've been hosting it in the cloud, a real version of VS Code, but it's much more commonly used on people's own Macs and PCs. And you can download it onto your own Mac and PC. You might have to jump through a few more hoops to get things like C working, though Python is much easier to get working as well. Some of the configuration won't be quite the same, like your prompt might look a little different and the like. But that's just going to be the case anytime you sit down in the future at a different system. It's going to look and feel a little different to things you've used before, but hopefully there'll be enough familiarities that you can get yourself up and running. Pretty quickly, nonetheless. Hosting a website, not necessarily something you have to do or will do for your final project, depending on your proposal, but there's lots of ways to just host your own portfolio page, home page, website, whatever、uh, on the internet itself using tools like these, GitHub or Netlify or other tools too, most of which have like free student friendly plans. Some of these are indeed paid services, but they very often have entry level plans that are totally fine if it's just you on the internet and you don't expect to have. Having thousands, ten thousands of users. It's a drop in the bucket for these companies, and so they very often have free tiers of service. If you want to host something more dynamic, something like CS50 Finance that takes user input and output, uses sessions, uses databases, you might like something like Heroku. And for instance, we have some documentation on one of CS50's websites for actually moving your implementation of CS50 Finance over to this third party application called Heroku so that you can actually run it or something like it in the cloud as well. Here, too, using a free tier of service. All of these providers, these are big cloud providers these days.、Uh, Amazon On Microsoft, Google, and others all have student friendly accounts that you can sign up for during or shortly after you're in school that just give you、uh, free compute time and storage.、Uh, GitHub itself has this whole student pack that, by transitivity, gives you access to a whole bunch of discounts and other things as well. So, if you're liking this stuff and you just want to like, learn more, perhaps over break, by playing on your own, these then would be some. Some good starting points. And as for just keeping abreast of trends in programming and technology or the like, there's so many different blogs and websites out there, but here are just some. A couple of different subreddits, so to speak, on Reddit that are very programming specific. Stack Overflow, with which you've probably uh, uh, interacted. Server Fault, which is similar. TechCrunch, Y Combinator, and other sites too. And ultimately, we would encourage all of you to stay in touch, certainly beyond today.、Um, by the time you finish your final projects, we'll have something waiting for you. And if you want to stay engaged, either on the teaching staff or just as a lifelong learner of CS and programming, by all means, check out any of these URLs here. But in just a Few weeks' time, will you have one of these to your name? Your very own I Took CS50 t shirt, which we will distribute before long as well. And now, if we may,、uh, we have an opportunity here to synthesize the past several weeks of material. If you would like to go ahead and open up the URL that we put on the screen earlier, I'll toss it up here again. You can use your phone or your laptop. You might recall for a previous problem set, we asked you to propose a whole bunch of review questions, multiple choice or the like, that synthesize the past several weeks of material.、Uh, we took some of our favorite submissions of those. Ported it to this Poll Everywhere platform so that we could interactively see where everyone's minds are at, understanding is at. And I think you'll find all of these are written by you and your classmates、um, that we slipped a few fun ones there, also written by you along the way. If Carter, you want to come on up here to get us ready, if you haven't yet opened the website, go to this URL here on your phone or your laptop. And let me go ahead and switch us over here before Carter takes control of this machine here. Here's that same 2D barcode again. Feel free to background that now. And in just a moment, we've got a, a 20 question quiz show. It's all multiple choice. So long as you have internet access, whether you're here physically or online right now, you should be able to buzz in within 10 to 20 seconds of seeing a question. And I'll read each one aloud. I think, Carter, we're just about good to go. So, does everyone have the software up and running on their phone or their laptop? If not, no big deal. Just look on with a friend. But otherwise, Carter, do you want to say hello to and tee us up? All right. What does CSS stand for? Is the first question written by you. Four possible options are cascading style sheet, coding style sheet, cascading style system, coded style sheet. 15 seconds, up to 300 responses already, both here in person and online. Give folks a few more seconds. What does CSS stand for? These are the four options that were provided. Three, two, one. Carter, 
Cascading style sheets at 86% is indeed the right answer. So, congrats to those of you, 86% who got that one. Here's the leaderboard. You all have fairly random usernames. But if your username is on this board here, or really any of the 86% of you that just got that right, all of you are currently in the lead. But we'll see if this shifts before long. Question two Which best s describe the role of a compiler? Is our next question. Debug one's code, run the written program, distinguish between functions and arguments, turn source code into machine code. 300 responses in so far, 10 seconds to go. Which best describes the role of a compiler? Three seconds, just crossed 400. And Carter? Turning source code into machine code at 92%. Some excellent progress there is indeed the correct answer. And indeed, more generally, a compiler just converts one language to another. The use cases we've seen for it have been only source code to machine code. But as you go out into the real world, you'll actually find there to be compilers from one source code language to another source code language that itself might be runnable or compilable thereafter. Good job to all of you guests. And Carter, number three. What is the type of arg C? asks a classmate. Int, stir, char, float. What is the type of arg C? All right, about 350 responses, seven seconds to go. About to cross the 400 threshold. And three, two, one. The type of arg C is int, is indeed caressed. But we're now starting to distinguish, folks. Only 55% there. Uh, char is not correct. You might be thinking of argv in C, but even that is not a char. It's a char star array, or a char star star, in fact. So it's not just a char. Stir is in Python, but even that, too, if you were thinking of sys.argv, that would be a list of stirs, not a single stir. All right, Carter, it's the leaderboard. All right, there are our guests, all in, still tied. And number four, what is the searching efficiency of a balanced? Binary search tree. Big O of n, big O of n squared, big O of log n, big O of n log n. What is the searching efficiency of a balanced binary search tree? The balanced being key because, as folks continue buzzing in, recall that bi、uh, cert- binary search trees can de- degrade, devolve into linked lists. Big O of log n is correct for 54%. All right, now people are getting annoyed, but let's keep going. Number five, leaderboard's not yet that interesting. More subtle, what was the CS50 Duck's Halloween costume? He's here in winter dress today, thanks to Valerie. A skeleton, a vampire, Frankenstein, or a ghost? What was its costume at Halloween a few weeks back? Answers are coming in a little slower this time. People online are perhaps clicking on the video. And vampire is correct at 69%. Nicely done. All right, guests are still shuffled in the top. Oh, and we're starting to see some leaders pull ahead. The time in which you buzz in is also taken into account now. In C, how can we unify several variables of different types into a single new type? Trees, arrays, structs, tables. Quiet and see how can we unify several variables of different types into a single new type. Eight seconds, 400 responses in, 450, and the answer is structs are indeed correct. Recall that we had a student struct and we saw structs later on for nodes that allowed us to cluster multiple variables or data types inside of our own brand new structure that we then type def to a name. Carter, shall we see the leaderboard now? All right. Whoever guessed 40, 45, and 43, 83 have eked ahead ever so slightly. So buzzing in fast can now benefit your score too. Next question, Carter. In Python, which of the following statements is false? Tuples are an ordered immutable set of data. Dictionaries associate keywords with values. Arrays in Python are of fixed size. Python is an object oriented language. Which of those statements is false? Three seconds. Answer is coming in more slowly. But the most popular answer is correct. Arrays in Python are indeed not of a fixed size, which is why that's false. They're not even called arrays, they're called lists. And recall that they dynamically grow and shrink, effectively implemented for you. 
as a linked list. All right, how do we? All right, we have a leader. Whoever 4383 is, nicely done. What does str comp re return in C? STRCMP. Does it return a Boolean, an integer, a string, or a char? What does str comp return in C? Used to compare two strings, of course. Recall that it returns potentially not just true, false, but, ooh, an integer is indeed correct. Does anyone recall why? Why is it an int and not just a simple true, false? Why is our three values helpful? Exactly. It returns zero if they're equal, or it returns negative value or a positive value based on whether one string comes before or after the other, ASCIIbetically, so to speak, based on its ASCII code.、Uh, the results, Carter? All right, 4383, still doing quite well, but being caught up with here. What is David Malin's phone number? 949 468 2750. Play when you call it. The Harvard alma mater, a parody of Yale's song, a recording of David Malin singing, Never Gonna Give You Up. Feel free to call or text. I can't get it now, but we have nicely automated that process. Four seconds, 400 responses in, and the answer, of course, is never gonna give you up. Thanks to a little programming and a script that our friend Rong Shin wrote that essentially answers the phone automatically and replies with a URL or a song. Carter? Oh, dethrone, dethrone. 2688, nicely done. Next question. <laughs> From which of the following places does malloc get free memory for a program to use? Heap, stack, array, or pointer? From which of the following places does malloc get free memory for a program to use? Answers are a little slower this time. Five seconds. And the answer is in. <laughs> OK, a y that's the answer we were given in the problem set, but I think uh, uh, we would beg to differ. Pretty sure, Carter, would you go with? I think it's indeed the heap. So this answer, not correct. I know, I know. We just transcribed what you gave us, though. Let's see how that affects the scores. OK, 2688 is still doing OK. Next question. About 10 or so to go. Suppose I have an unsorted list of items, store receipts perhaps. Should I sort the items before searching for an element? Yes, you should always sort before searching. No, you should never sort before searching. If you will be searching the list many times, then yes, you should sort first. If you will be searching the list many times, then no, you should not sort first. Some nuanced replies. Five seconds. Few fewer answers than usual at this point. And if you will be searching the list many times, then yes, you should sort first. An example that we discussed of trade offs, because if you're just going to do a one off search and never again, why bother incurring n log n or n squared time to actually sort the thing? All right, some shuffling happening, but 2688, nicely done. Next question. When you run the create index command in SQL, what type of data structure do you create? Array, B trees, linked lists, hash tables. When you run create index, recall we did this with like the movie titles, the TV show titles to speed things up so that things wouldn't be super long and linear. We did a different data structure. All right, about 400 responses in. The answer is indeed B trees. B trees. Not to be confused with binary tree, a B tree typically has other children besides two that pulls the data even higher up from the leaves of the tree.、Uh, could use a hash table, could use a linked list, but indeed the technology in databases is generally these things called B trees, certainly in SQLite. Carter? Oh, dethroned, but 4179 has now pulled ahead. Nicely done. Next question. What HTTP status code means I'm a teapot? 000-418-007-128. This recall was an April Fool's joke by technical people、uh, some years ago that has become part of computing lore. 
It's still there, though, in the document. In two seconds, we'll know that it's 418 indeed. Let's see how that affected things. 4179 is way down on the list. 7280 is number one now. Nicely done. What is an example of a SQL injection attack? When someone submits malicious SQL commands via a web form, physically destroying a computer hardware that stores a SQL database, overwhelming a server with thousands of requests to access a database, injection attacks are only in movies or TV. Five seconds, some fun answers. 400 responses about in, and indeed, when someone submits malicious SQL commands via a web form because the, the programmer is not escaping the code using the question mark syntax that we've seen, using CS50's library or other third party libraries like it. Carter? 7280 is still the guest to beat. Nearing the end, few more questions. How are the elements of an array stored in memory? Contiguously, in random locations that happen to be available. As a linked list, as a binary tree. How are the elements of an array stored in memory? About five seconds to go. Almost have everyone in. Two, one, and contiguously is indeed the right answer. Back to back to back in random locations that happen to be available is probably describing your use of malloc in the heap. But you would then need a linked list or some other structure to stitch those locations together. An array, by definition, is contiguous. Carter? 7280 is hanging on to that lead by about、uh, 499 points. Next up is. Which SQL query would allow you to select the ID of a specific movie star, Zendaya, in a table of movie stars? Select ID where name equals Zendaya. Select star ID from movie stars where name equals Zendaya. Select ID from movie stars where name equals Zendaya. Select ID from movie stars where name equals quote unquote Zendaya. And I, I'm spoiling it.、Uh, I should have read out some quotes earlier, too. One second. The last one is correct. And indeed, this one's almost correct, but lacks the single quotes. Zendaya is not a, single,、uh, is not a uh, SQL keyword. It's, of course, a string, so it does need to be escaped there. But 63% of you realize that. 7280 is still in the lead. I think we have a few more questions to go. Why is a hash table faster to search than a linked list, even though the runtime for both is big O of n? The hash table actually has big O of n squared runtime. The hash table optimally has omega of O runtime.、Uh, the hash table creates shorter linked lists to search rather than one long linked list. The hash table takes less memory. And this was an example of practical versus theoretical differences. And indeed, That was interesting. With 83% of you buzzing in, the hash table creates shorter linked lists, ideally, if you have a good hash function rather than one long linked list, even though technically it's still in big O of n. 7280 seemed to know that, is pulling ahead of the crowd. Still a few questions <laughs> is Game of Thrones is a dot, 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 comedy, drama, historical, fantasy, documentary, romance, sci fi, or all of the above? This is written by your classmates, recall, based on our SQL week. In five seconds, we'll be reminded that, according to our CSV file, they were all of the above. <laughs> OK, all of the above. All right, 7280 did OK with that. Next question Which of the following is a golden rule when allocating memory? Every block of memory that you malloc must be freed. Only memory that you malloc should be freed. Do not free a block of memory more than once. All of the above. More into the nuances of C. This golden rule when allocating memory. Didn't have to worry about this in Python. We did in C. In two seconds, we'll know that all of the above are indeed things you must do. Not doing those would be, in fact, bugs. Carter, the leaderboard. Still doing well. 7280, whoever you are. Last few questions. Last question, in fact. Last question. What do the binary bulbs on stage spell today? The answers could be、uh, face with medical mask, face with tears of joy, snowman without snow, or red heart. 
What do the binary bulbs on stage spell? Six, five, four, three. The answer is the red heart. Taking a look at the leaderboard here, who's our winner? The winner is, oh, guest 3487. A big round of applause for our guest. Thank you to Carter. So it's, it's nice that there was some opportunity here um, because recall that in week zero, we did start talking about emoji and really about data and representation. And we talked not about just binary, but ASCII and then Unicode. And then when we had Unicode, we had all of these additional bits that we could play with. And we could start to represent not just letters of the English alphabet as in ASCII, but really letters of any human alphabet and even alphabets that are continuing to develop. And indeed, this was faced with Medical Mask, which we claimed at the time was just how a Mac or PC or Android phone or iPhone nowadays would interpret and display a pattern of bits like this. This happening to be for the four bytes that represent that particular emoji. And over time, humans have been deciding to use different patterns for new and uh, new uh, emojis that might not have existed yesterday. And indeed, most any time you update your Mac or your PC or your phone these days, uh, at least on a semi-annual basis, are you getting some new and improved emojis. And they're not just these faces now. They're, of course, representing different human emotions, different physical objects, and ultimately among the Code Consortium's goals is to be able to represent all human languages. But were it not for certain groups of people and certain individuals, these things would all rather look fairly similar. And indeed, today we're so pleased to be joined by an old classmate of mine, Jennifer Aitley, who was class of 99 here at the college, who's gone off to do many, many different things in life, prolifically so. Um, not only has she been a writer, an author, a journalist for the New York Times, a producer of films like The Harvard Computers, The Search for General Tso, and The Emoji Story, which focuses on exactly today's topic, uh, Jenny and her colleagues have been involved, particularly particularly with um, championing representation of different types of people and cultures and languages. And these are just a few of the emojis that our friend Jenny has indeed brought into creation on our phones and laptops. Jenny, too, is the original inspiration for what has become, it seems, my Twitter recommendations and all of these puppets. I was visiting her in Manhattan one time some years ago. She had on her shelf a couple of puppets known as Muppet Whatnots. At the time, you could go to FAO Schwartz or the website, therefore, an old toy store, and you could actually configure your very own Muppets. And I thought this was the cool thing, and literally on the cab ride home from her place was I logging into the website, configuring a couple of puppets. A couple weeks later, they arrived, and then rather sat on my shelf for a couple of years as I wondered why I had just bought two Muppets in the back of a cab, but brought them into the office at one point. A colleague saw them, drew inspiration from them, and now have they been woven really into the fabric of this course in particular and a lot of the course's pedagogy, at least incarnated here just for fun, but also in video form as well. Which is only to say, so glad that our friend Jenny Aitley is here for us today to talk about these emoji. Jenny? This is very exciting. I took CS50 in 1994. Um, to give you a sense, one of my block mates was the first intern for Netscape, if you guys have ever heard of Netscape. And um, I graduated just as Google was come. Like, we did not have Google when we were undergrads. So um, it's an honor, obviously, to be in, um, at CS50. It's also very impressive to see how David has turned it from uh, entry level computer science course into a lifestyle brand that is world renowned. So it's an honor. And I'm going to talk to you today about how an emoji becomes an emoji. Um, so first, I'm going to talk about my journey down a rabbit hole of how I got involved with emoji. So this is my friend, uh, Ying Liu. She is a designer famous for designing the Twitter fail whale, which was like this kind of image that popped up um, when Twitter went down, which back in the day was rather often. So she's Chinese Australian American, so which is like a weird, interesting combination. And uh, so one day we were texting about dumplings because that is what Chinese ish women do. We text about food. And so I sent her this picture of dumplings, and then she said, yum, 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 um, you know, knife and fork, knife and fork, knife and fork. And then she was like, oh, I'm surprised that Apple doesn't have a dumpling emoji. And I'm like, oh yeah, that's kind of weird. And you know, it's one of those things where, 
you know, the thought comes to your head and then it leaves. I, I was, you know, it was just sort of a, an observation, but then half an hour later, onto my phone pops up this like dumpling emoji with hearts. Actually, you can't see it here, but it actually had like blinking eyes. So she called it bling bling dumpling. She's a designer, so she decided she was gonna fix um, this like lack of dumpling emoji problem. And I was actually like really puzzled, like how could there be no dumpling emoji, right? Because, you know, I knew that emoji are originally Japanese. This, by the way, was back in 2015. So Japanese foods, super well represented on the emoji keyboard. You have ramen, you have tempura, you have curry, you have, uh, actually wait, bento box curry, then tempura. Uh, you, have a, you even have like kind of slightly weird foods, like, um, let's see, you have these like things on a stick, which are fish cakes, I discovered. Then you have this white and pink swirly thing, which is also a fish cake. You even have this like, triangle thing that looks like it's had a bikini wax. But in essence, there were all these foods that were on the keyboard, but there was no dumpling, right? And I was like, dumplings are this kind of universal food. Like every culture has some version of a dumpling, whether or not it's empanadas or ravioli or, um, God, what else? Uh, ravioli, pierogi, momos, you know, jiaozi. The whole idea is all cultures have basically found the idea, like this concept of like yummy goodness within a carbohydrate shell, whether or not it's baked or steamed or fried. So dumplings are universal. Emoji, I didn't use them that much, but I was like, they're also kind of universal. So the fact there was no dumpling emoji told me like whatever system was in place failed. And I actually had no idea. I was like, who controls emoji? I'm going to go fix this problem. Like there is, something wrong with the universe if there's no dumpling emoji, and I took it upon myself to like go fix that. So I Googled, um, and I basically discovered there was this thing you know, called the Unicode Consortium, which is a nonprofit based in Count, uh, let's see, Mountain View, California, that when I looked had these like 12 full voting members. So this was late 2015. Of those 12, nine were multinational US tech companies. So there was Oracle, IBM, Microsoft, Adobe, Google, Apple, Facebook, and Yahoo. So these were um, eight, I think. And then, then you had the German software company SAP, the Chinese company called Huawei, and then the government of Oman. So these were like basically the people who were in, in charge and had full voting power on Unicode. So they paid $18,000 a year. Um, to have this full voting power, which is a lot of money. I was like kind of very indignant on like how this cabal of tech companies basically control this global um, curated image-based language on your keyboard. So there was a little bit of a kind of loophole, which is you could, you could pay $18,000 a year to have full voting power, or um, you could pay $75 a year as an individual, you had no voting power, but you had the ability to sign up for the email list and also show up at the meetings. So put in my credit card, got on the email list, and like, was like kind of checking my email one day when there was an invite that said they were gonna have a quarterly meeting, and I think this was gonna be October 2015, and I looked, uh, it was in Sunnyvale, I looked at my calendar, I looked at, you know, uh, the point that I was actually gonna be able to be in Silicon Valley at that time. So I took a bus to Apple where they were having that meeting. And I don't know completely what I thought I was gonna see. Like I think maybe it was gonna be like, maybe like a Sanders theater or like a little mini Congress like people making emoji decisions. But that was not what it was. Basically this is the room um, where it happens. These in 2015 were the people who were deciding emoji. You know, these were emoji decision makers, which were not like the most demographically kind of um, diverse group. Um, they had a sense of humor about it. One guy had a shirt that said shadowy emoji overlord. And so I decided, along with my friend Ian Liu, to create a group called Emoji Nation, whose motto is emoji by the people for the people. And it kind of kind of brought the voice of like the normal world into the decision making chain. So, um, you know, we launched a little campaign. 
uh, about dumpling emojis. We made a Kickstarter video. Um, let's see. Dumpling kind of like... is one of the most universal cross-cultural foods in the world. Georgia has kinkali, Japan has gyoza, Korea has mandu, Italy has ravioli, Poland has pierogi, Russia has pelmeni, Argentina has empanadas, Jewish people have kreple, China has pot stickers, Nepal and Tibet have momos. Yet somehow, despite their popularity, there is no dumpling emoji in the standard set. Why is that? Emoji exists for pizza, tempura, sushi, spaghetti, hot dog, and now tacos, which Taco Bell takes credit for. We need to write this disparity. Dumplings are global. Emoji are global. Isn't it time we brought them together? Oh yeah, and while we're at it, how about an emoji for Chinese takeout? So, um, so this is Thanksgiving of 2015. I wrote a dumpling emoji proposal. This is it. Um, you know, kind of different styles, like whether or not it's a head-on view or a slightly diagonal view. Um, and so we, we, that's Yi Ying, with then um, one of the co-chairs of the emoji subcommittee. And so along with dumpling, we also did takeout box, we got chopsticks, and then fortune cookie, which actually, I have to be honest, I don't think fortune cookie would have gotten in on its own merits were it not on the coattails of the other three. So we got these four through, um, and you know that, that is how they look today. And I have to say that that dumpling looks really photorealistic in the Apple world, unlike the fortune cookie, which has like no slit. It looks like a dead Pac-Man. I don't know what is going on with that um, design, but uh, so very proud. You know, I also did a lot of research on Chinese food in America and wrote a book called The Fortune Cookie Chronicles, produced a documentary called The Search for General So. So like I had a lot of moral authority on the issues of, uh, you know, Asian food in America. Not all things, but this one I felt like I had like made a mark on a 2,500 year history of emoji, oh sorry, of uh, dumplings by moving them into emoji. So it kind of gets into this very complicated thing, like how does an emoji become an emoji? And it's actually fairly complex. Um, so let's say you have an idea for an emoji, you write a proposal, and then you submit it to the emoji subcommittee. Um, that Lynn like debates and thinks about it, uh, sometimes they have feedback and they kick it back to you. And if so, then it, you have to revise it and it kind of goes around and around in a circle. And, and then it, they, once they're happy with it, they kick it to the full Unicode technical committee, which is sort of like sort of a governing body within Unicode on things technical and encoding. So what are the kinds of things that impact um, whether an emoji can be an emoji? So one, um, is there popular demand? Is it frequently requested? Um, and at this point, one of the very crude ways that we measure is uh, if you search for it on Google, this would have more than 500 million uh, kind of like results, which is what elephant gets in English. And that's sort of like a median, like elephant is like kind of right in the middle of like popular emoji and not popular emoji. So we use that as a benchmark. There's a plus if there's multiple usages and meanings. For example, um, like sloth. That was an emoji that we did. It also, you know, it's both in it literally kind of an emoji of an animal, but it also has lots of connotations. So if something has lots of multiple meanings, that kind of gives it a bump. Um, one thing is visually distinctive. Like, does it work at little tiny emoji sizes? And that's actually really hard because there's some things that I think could have been emoji but don't completely um, work when you try to shrink it down. And I'll give some examples of that later. And then kind of uh, filling the gap or completeness is another factor. So for a long time, we had red heart, yellow heart, green heart, blue heart, purple heart. There was no orange heart. And so there was um, a gay designer from Adobe who was like actually very heartbroken by that. So he had been substituting the pumpkin to get the orange, to get the rainbow. And so he proposed an orange heart and that was you know, obviously at that point you're like, yes, that will complete a set. Um, and another thing is, is it already something that, you know, one of the companies um, has and therefore everyone else um, is going to like adopt it. And so a good example for that is um, the binary, I think it was the non-gender binary emoji, the pink, blue, and white flag. 
So I have to say, WhatsApp is by far one of the most rogue um, platforms. So they just like randomly like added it one day and we just notice it and we're like, oh God, so given that they have to do it, now we have to build it into the stack. Um, so factors of exclusion or against inclusion to be more PC. Sometimes if it's too specific or narrow, um, that works against being included. So poutine, which the Canadians love, was kind of really specific. And I know it's really important to the Canadians, but it just kind of didn't have an enough sort of global appeal. Um, if it's redundant, so an example for that is a couple years ago, Butterball proposed like a roasted turkey emoji, but we already had like an unroasted live emoji of a turkey. So it wasn't clear that we needed the cooked version to go with like the live version. So that didn't pass. Um, not visually discernible. So this one's actually really tricky um, and knocks out a lot of things. So it knocked out kimchi, for example, really hard to do kimchi at emoji sizes. Like how you, is it in the jar? Is it like, you know, just sort of in a little bowl? So kimchi kind of got, kind of died on that. Another one that was really hard was cave emoji, actually, um, really hard at emoji sizes. And then this is interesting, no logos, brands, deities, or celebrities. Um, and this is a new policy we just introduced, which is no more flags. Flags were killing us in terms of all kinds of complicated reasons, and there was much regret that we ever added flags and, um, and, and lots of politics. So at this point, we're, no more flags. So um, once it kind of gets passed into the, the full Unicode Technical Committee, the proposal gets voted on like once a year, and then they pass all the emoji for the next year. We just actually did that a couple of weeks ago. And it takes a while, it gets sent to all the um, companies like Apple, Google, Adobe, Facebook, and then they add it to all your devices. And, and then ta-da, it takes about 18 to 24 months from when you have, first have your proposal to when it lands onto your devices. So Emoji Nation has worked on a bunch of emoji, and so we've kind of shepherded this through. So one of the interesting questions is, why is it that Unicode controls emoji? So a lot of it has to go, um, kind of do with, it has to do with the history of emoji. They were originally popularized in Japan. There was a very, one of the initial sets is from 1999 from Docomo. These were actually recently collected by the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. Um, and so all the, the Japanese um, vendors had these like little glyphs that they added to their character set. And the main problem is like, if you were Docomo, you had like, you know, one set. If you were in SoftBank, you had another set. So no matter what, you couldn't, you could only kind of text with people who are on your platform, not across platforms. And that was a real big problem when Apple and Google started introducing smartphones into Japan. And there was sort of this kind of understanding and expectation that if you, if you did something in your smartphone, you also want it to show up in email and be sent into you know, into the ether and someone else is supposed to get the same uh, image that you sent. So that was not the case. So in 2007, they went to Unicode and asked them to like basically unify the emoji set. And Unicode is interesting because its mission is to enable everyone uh, speaking every language on earth to be able to use their language on computers and smartphones. And they actually see this as a human right. Because at a certain point, if your language cannot be captured digitally, it's going to disappear. So you know, they spend a lot of time doing Chinese, Arabic, uh, Cyrillic in the very early days. Um, in 2001, they actually had a proposal for Klingon, which they did not actually accept at that point. So they have three major projects. Um, they encode characters, including emoji. That's actually what they're most famous for. Um, they also have a bunch of localization resources. So um, that's like, you know, in this country, they use this as a currency and they use this kind of um, time format. And like it's, you know, whether or not it's month, month, date, date, year, 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 year. In some countries, it's, you know, date, date, month, month, year, 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 year in other countries. So they kind of tell you what country cares about what. And then they also then have the libraries um, so that no one's basically programming things from scratch. So what's really funny is you say CLDR really fast. It sounds like seal deer, and this really confused one of the girlfriends, one of the engineers, why he was always talking about seal deers. And so she uh, basically surgically attached a bunch of antlers to this little guy um, and made a, a seal deer. And um, so it took three years between 2007 to 2010 
uh, to introduce the first Unicode emoji set. So this, these were the ones that kind of came out. It took many, many years to figure out like how to reconcile all the different images and like which one should we include, which ones we shouldn't include. Um, and as you guys probably know from CSFD, a Unicode code point is a unique number assigned to each Unicode character. So you can represent that emoji tears with a uh, face with tears of joy as this or this or the binary code. So emoji are just kind of hanging out on your phone after 2010 until 2011 when Apple suddenly made them much um, easier to access on your phone. And one of the kind of confusing things, of course, is like emoji are very ambiguous and it's not always clear what they mean. And that's one of the great joys, right? It's, it can be more, um, there's, there's much more interpretation on, 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 in terms between the sender and the uh, receiver. So if you actually look, if you start doing that on Google, the, the autocompletes are like, what does it mean when a guy sends it to you? What does it mean when a girl sends it to you? And um, clearly many, many people have been <laughs> confused by that emoji when it's been sent to them. So who can propose emoji? And the short answer is basically anyone. Uh, there's a Google form that is open between April and August. Um, so the hijab emoji actually was originally proposed by a 15 year old girl who is Saudi Arabian but lived in Germany, uh, Rayouf al Khumaidi, who actually got into Harvard and then chose Stanford. So I've always given her a hard time about that. I know, well, <laughs> I'm kind of on that. I was like, hmm. Um, so she wrote the proposal and it, it got through and she's actually the subject of um, the documentary that we put together called The Emoji Story. We also have a group of Argentinians who fought really hard for the mate emoji, their national drink. And then there was um, this nonprofit for girls advocacy that really wanted a menstruation emoji and they sent in this bloody underpants uh, proposal which is like really terrible, I'll be honest. So we kind of worked with them and got blood drop, uh, which actually is one of, like actually it's done pretty statistically like, like well. We were kind of surprised actually how popular it is. Um, the skin tone emoji were actually proposed not from within Unicode, clearly. It was done by a mom from Houston who's also an entrepreneur because her daughter asked her, came home one day and said, um, I really like an emoji that looks like me. And her mom, Katrina Parrott, was like, that's great, honey. What's an emoji? And so, but she actually had worked in procurement with NASA, and so she understood forms for proposals, and she actually was the one uh, we should thank for having like five skin tones today. Um, women's flat shoe and sort of the, the one-piece bathing suit, and as opposed to just the you know uh, yellow, you know, teeny weeny yellow polka dot bikini, is a mother of three now four who. Um, just wrote that because she was very offended that, that all of the shoe emoji had high heels for women. Um, I actually really like this guy. Some random guy in Germany came up with this uh, emoji, as we like to say, it's the Colbert emoji. He wrote a proposal and it got accepted because it, it was a really good proposal. Then you even have governments, the Finnish government, like literally the Finnish government, they're equivalent to the uh, Department of State, uh, proposed a sauna emoji, which these are the, images, and I think they're really ugly. For, I mean, they're all, there's, there's so many problems with this emoji, but we helped them as Emoji Nation. First, we like got rid of the club feet and then you know, gave them you know, sort of examples, like you know, do you want them to hold the ladle? Do you want like, the, the sort of steam around it? Do you want like, it um, you know, with like, clothing or not clothing, we actually did um, a, little, you know, a little bit of a towel for the more modest in us. So it got passed, and then the way it ended up uh, is basically person in a steamy room. So this is how it kind of evolved. So you can see that is what Finland kind of submitted, that is what we submitted, and then that is how it's ended up on your phone. And that is basically supposed to mean sauna emoji. Um, so one of the questions is like, why do I care so much about emoji and representation of emoji. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that I grew up speaking Chinese and like going to Sunday school or Saturday um, Chinese school. And as you can see, there's sort of like some really interesting parallels between modern day emoji and like Chinese radicals and characters from a long time ago. So this is fire, this is mouth, this is tree, this is moon, this is sun. Uh, and you can mix and match them in Chinese as well. So one of the interesting ones is like, you know, two trees together, basically makes a forest. 
you have like a sun and a moon together, and that means bright in Chinese. It's kind of fun. Then um, this one's fun, right? So it's basically a pig underneath a roof. So you're like, oh, maybe that means farm or like, I don't know, like a barn or some kind of like animal thing. But actually that in Chinese means home, jia or family. So like home is where your pigs are, which I think is, says a lot about society and um, what people cared about way back in ancient China. Um, this is one of my favorites. So this is a character for woman or female, ni. And it, I guess it kind of looks like this, like, you know, she's like curtsying or something. So um, super interesting character if you like grow up, like, you know, writing your characters, you know. So, um, so this is a woman underneath a roof. And you're like, oh, that might mean like wife or family or something. But um, it actually doesn't. It means peace on. So the idea is like things are at peace when the woman is under a roof, which I always thought kind of like, I felt like kind of weird about that growing up. Um, another one is, okay, there's a woman and then you have a child or boy child specifically. So you're like, oh, that might mean family or mother or something, but actually it means good. So the standard for good in ancient China was a woman with a boy child, which I thought was also, you know, as a six year old was, I found problematic as well. Um, and all kinds of <laughs> interesting things in, Chinese use the female radical. So three women together means evil. This one means greedy. This one means slave. This one means jealous. This one means betrayal or adultery, which I think is interesting. So in case you want to bring this to your favorite 10-year-old, we have a Chinese like an emoji uh, kids book coming out from MIT Press in the fall called Hanmoji. From, so it's from MIT Teen Press, it's super fun. So it's a lot of these concepts but like a little bit more rigorous. And um, this idea of like gender in emoji was really important to a bunch of us as we were kind of working through the issues. So for a long time, you know, on the emoji keyboard, there are all kinds of jobs you could have as a man, like you could be a police officer, you could be a detective, you could be a Buckingham Palace guard, you could even be Santa, you could be black Santa, right? But until, as of 2015, if you're a woman, there are only four jobs you could have on the emoji keyboard. So you could be a princess, you could be a bride, you could be a dancer, or you could be a boy boy bunny. So those are your like four choices. And um, so we worked really hard on like trying to diversify what women could be. Um, and one of the ways we did it was through this idea of like combining emoji. So in emoji land, there's something called Zwidge, a zero with joiner. And a lot of emoji that you see are actually glued together. So the rainbow plus flag is how you get rainbow flag. And this is actually how we worked on um, introducing a bunch of the, um, the occupations in emoji land. So a lot of these are like, you know, the chef is a woman plus um, like the fry, frying pan or a teacher is a woman plus, or a man actually, plus a school. Um, and so one of the interesting things is you can actually have, um, as, as a result of all the gender parity stuff, we actually had to make male and female versions of all the emoji, because some of them originally were passed as like man and tuxedo. And now because we had gendered versions of everything, we now have women with tuxedo. I don't know if you noticed, there's also man in a wedding dress to, to kind of complement the woman in a wedding dress. Um, there's now actually also bearded woman. I don't know if you've noticed that. So it gets interesting because originally at a certain point we had passed women breastfeeding. And then there was like all of this like complaints coming into Unicode about what about men as caretakers? You can't actually tell she's breastfeeding. It's more just like she's holding it. So people are like, what about the man as a caretaker? Like paternity leave and da 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 da. So um, there is now like, like man kind of nursing the child. And um, the other kind of ways you can combine um, the emoji are through skin tones. So unfortunately, those are not through ridges. This is through an older kind of technology where you have all the skin tones are basically the yellow character plus like a little square box at the end. We call them skin tone modifiers. And um, in terms of what are the things that we worked on at Emoji Nation, which is one of the hardest ones, was to create um, 
the interracial couples, and we worked on that with Tinder, which really cared about it because apparently, which I thought was interesting, when you introduce online dating into a community, the rates of interracial marriage go up. Um, and there's a pretty interesting academic paper that kind of systematically looks at the rollout through different countries and different um, communities. So it was really nice to see it introduced on the phone. One of my friends cried. Um, in terms of emoji nation emoji, we've worked on a lot. So these are just a sampling of the ones that we've um, done. I really liked, let's see, DNA, I feel really good about. Lobster on behalf of people from Maine. Um, yarn and uh, thread for all the people who like knitting. There was bagel emoji on behalf of like all New Yorkers. Um, this emoji actually, which we called micro, was like very sleepy on the keyboard until 2020 and it really had its moment. I'm really, really kind of proud, proud of that one. And um, there is yoga emoji sponge. So these are just a sampling of the ones that we worked on. And this is a sampling of the people who have contributed. You too, if you feel really passionate about emoji, could like impact billions of keyboards worldwide. So it's interesting to see in terms of frequency of use, it's very power law, right? So here's sort of, these are actually um, like order magnitude. Like, so one is half of this, two is half of one all the way down. Um, and one of the most stunning things I, I was surprised to see is that face of tears of joy by itself is like almost 10% of all emoji sent, 9.9 percent of emoji is just that one character. Number two is red heart, which I guess you guys can see in its binary form. And then it falls off like pretty quickly. So I know I'm hearing that face of tears of joy is very boomer or very gen X and that it's uh, maybe among you guys, it's a little bit kind of um, blase or declasse at this point. Um, so the future emoji, we really don't, Unicode does not want to be encoding emoji. Um, and along the way, I became a vice chair of the Unicode Emoji Subcommittee. So I went from like kind of shaking my, <laughs> my fist at the institution to becoming part of the institution. Um, so there's one idea, this coded hashes of arbitrary images. Can we create a system where instead of um, just using a binary code to represent all the different emoji, we actually can do specific images, we create hashes, and then like you look and you can look up like th by the hash which image you're looking you know, at. So that was the idea, this is from a Stanford professor, didn't really get take off. Then there was this idea using Wikipedia um, or Wikimedia, the Wikidata QID numbers, which uh, I didn't know this until this proposal came along, but everything in Wikipedia has a number um, and that allows it to sort of match things between different languages. So in Chinese, the page for Obama match, is matched with the English page, with this, you know, Arabic page, um, and that went nowhere. So um, what I'm going to finish with is telling you what the new emoji are. You guys are among the first people to hear about this because no one's really been paying attention. <laughs> so this, this was published a couple of weeks ago, but like, like it made no news because you have to be looking at the Unicode register. Um, so first off, more hearts, because you guys all love hearts. So there's light blue heart, gray heart, and pink heart. There was kind of debate, do we need more pink hearts? And the answer seems to be yes. Um, light blue is really interesting, because in some cultures, light blue and dark blue are different colors. In our culture, we just call them like versions of blue. It's sort of like how in our, in English, pink and red are different colors. But um, in some cultures, there isn't a difference between pink and red. Then there were a bunch of bird things. The wing emoji is coming, blackbird and goose. I don't really, don't really know why. Um, hyacinth uh, as a flower. This has like very popular in Iranian culture. Jellyfish, I don't know. I, 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 I'm very suspicious of jellyfish because um, they, used to, they used man of war as one of their like phrases that they searched for. And that had a billion, I think like it had a lot of entries and I, I feel like those were not about the actual invertebrate, like there was something else going on there, but kind of wrote in on that. Um, moose on behalf of the Canadians, donkey uh, on behalf of, I guess the Democrats. Um, so that was interesting because like you had to have the donkey look different from a horse and there was a whole debate like, 
Do you want a donkey head or do you want a donkey body? Do you want donkey with floppy ears? Do you want like all kinds of donkey debate? And it was actually originally proposed in 2019 and just got in this year. Um, ginger uh, and pea pod. These are, these are kind of weird, like the food thing has kind of got in in a, in a weird way. Ginger was good because it also represented root. And then wireless got in, which is interesting because we couldn't use the phrase Wi-Fi because that's actually trademarked by like the Wi-Fi people. And then on behalf of um, Sikhs, Khanda finally got in. It was the largest religion that wasn't already represented on the emoji keyboard. And then on behalf of like the faces, <laughs> shaking face. <laughs> so uh, I don't, I'm glad you guys are really excited by that. It is, it is unclear to me, um, like, I was not a big proponent of this, but your excitement about it makes me change my mind. Um, then folding hand fan. I actually find that one interesting because I think it was just like college students or fresh out of college students who were like, we want to do a proposal that passes. And they were very opportunistic and just sort of like chose fan. And then the first day submitted electric fan and then we told them like, oh, the longevity for electric fan isn't great, even though it's been around for a couple hundred years. Why don't we go with the folding hand fan, which is a much longer history? And then this one is actually a big deal, is um, Afro hair pick on behalf. There was a lot of controversy about and debate about curly hair and it's supposed to be represent Afros and then Apple did not do that. So everyone else has very Afro looking hair. Apple just makes it look wavy. And so there was like upsetness that like black hair wasn't represented in the emoji set. And so this was a proposal that someone worked on. Um, and then animals, uh, sorry, not animals, uh, instruments, maracas and flute. Um, and that's it. So in terms of, if you have any questions, you can look at emojination.org. You can email me for all things emoji, um, jenny at emojination.org. And remember, you guys can actually impact billions of keyboards around the world. I mean, it's a little bit of impact for humans, but billions, so it adds up to a lot. And if you have any more questions, I am here and can give you know, lots of answers and questions. And I'm really thrilled, actually, to kind of bring the emoji um, flag waving to such a large crowd, and especially a large, you know, diverse and very motivated crowd. And um, one of the interesting things is we've kind of like, this is, I'm not a proponent of this, but they've slowly decreased the number of emoji per year. It was like 70, then it was 50, then it was 30, and this year we only did 20. And I'm, um, I'm a little bit sad about that, but I hope that you know, if there's more you know, excited um, proposals that can be submitted to Unicode, we might be able to dial that number back up. So that is me. Am I good? Yay, so thank you. <laughs> Oh, yes. like, this is about 20 years late, but thank you so much, Jenny. Thank we have an you. I took CS50 t-shirt for you. <laughs> On the way out, too, we have some CS50 stress balls for you. Cannot wait to see your final projects come on up. If you'd like to chat with Jenny, this was CS50. See you soon. Thank you.